Testing, testing. Okay. There is a reference to uh, in, in Doc's poem to uh, other people wanting to maybe ring the Lord's line. And it reminded me of my early days at Tennessee. Um, at that time, the official, we never, we didn't even know there was a Methodist hymnal. We didn't know the exi one existed. We had a, a hymn book called Worldwide Church Songs. This is when I was a teenager, teenage chapel, and uh, that book, Worldwide Church Songs, was published by Stamps Quartet Music Company. Not Sam Baxter, Stamps Quartet Music Company. And it had a song in there called Royal Telephone. And it was my favorite of all the songs in there at that time. And my Aunt Alma Tenney played the piano uh, by ear. Her daughter, Maxine Tenney, led the singing. And it was always by request. You know, people, the congregation would call out song, your favorite song, you know. And, and she would turn to that page and we would sing it. And I was always calling for the Royal Telephone. Later, many years later, Burl Ives, I don't know when he recorded it, but many years later I discovered that Burl Ives had recorded that song. So that became one of my favorite Burl Ives songs. Um, also, um, I mentioned that uh, the, for what it's worth, FYI to everybody, that date that Conrad mentioned, that the 2020 Cowboy Poetry event. Uh, conflicts with the date for that month's Life Poets Society. So we have some planning to do. Uh, and maybe Doc and Conrad and I can meet after we get done here and talk about that a little bit as to how we want to deal with that. Uh, I have a poem here to, to read. It's really like Doc's, uh, it's a song actually. You may have heard Jerry Jeff Walker sing this song. He wrote this song, or the poem, whichever you want to call it, as well. Jerry Jeff Walker. And he calls it, the title of it is Charlie Dunn. That name might ring a bell with some. If it does, raise your hand. Okay. It doesn't ring a bell. Charlie That's the name of the poem. It's not a very long poem. And I'm going to read it. Well, if you're ever in Austin, Texas, a little run down on your soul, I'm going to tell you the name of a man to see. I'm going to tell you right where to go. He's working in Capital Saturday, and he's sewing in the back of the place. He is old Charlie Dunn, the little frail one, with the smiling leathery face. Charlie Dunn, he is the one to see. Charlie done the boots that are on my feet. It makes Charlie real pleased to see me walking with ease. Charlie done. He's the one to see. Charlie's been making boots over there, he says, about 50 some odd years. And once you wear a pair, 
of his handmade boots. You know you will never wear a store-bought pair. Charlie can tell you what's wrong with your feet just by feeling them with his hand. And he can take a look at the boots you wear and know. Now old Buck's up front. He's counting his gold. Charlie's in the back patching up the soles of the people coming in and smiling at him. They all wonder, how's old Charlie been? And old Buck's making change. He never sees no one. He never understood the good thing that Charlie done. Yeah, old Charlie never had his name on the sign. He never put a mark in his boots. <clears throat> he just hopes that you remember him the same way that he does you. He keeps your measurement in this little book so you can order more boots later on. Well, I'm writing down some of old Charlie's sighs because I'm making him up this song. Yeah, old Buck's making change. He never sees no one. He never understood the good thing that Charlie done. Buck was Buck Steiner. He was the owner of the place that Charlie made worked at and made most of the boots that he made. Toward the end, of, and that's the end of the poem, but I have a few words to say about it. Toward the end of my senior year at Winsboro High School, I was lucky enough to be elected state FFA president. And I decided to put off college, delay college for a year, to serve in that capacity. I was the first one, the first state president to do that. And within just a few years, it became a requirement that the state FFA president take a year off and serve full time as state president, even though there was no salary involved with the job. It was a, an honor job that all the past state presidents from then on have gladly done. What happened though that year after I was lucky enough to be elected to that office, my FFA advisor was named Bill Potter, and he's the reason that I became that I was elected state FFA president. Absent him, and that never would have happened. He changed my life. Changed it for the better in many, many ways. One of the things he did after that election and before I started serving in that capacity was the Winsboro FFA chapter had four honorary members. One of them was uh, Mr. Ferguson, who was the superintendent of the school. Another one was Mr. Tenney, who used to have a feed store down here on Market Street, and who at that time was on the school board. Uh, one of the others uh, was uh, a Mr. Woosley, who was chairman of the school board. And Mr. Pollard, my ag teacher, talked to those honorary members of the FFA chapter. And since Winsboro had never had a state president before, he, could, he suggested that they consider chipping in the money to have their, the new state president a pair of handmade boots made. And they agreed to do that. And Mr. Pollard drove me down to Austin, a capital salary, where old Buck never saw me, but 
Old Charlie Don took my measurements and made these boots. Those are Charlie Dunn boots. And I've had the pleasure of telling a few friends about them from time to time uh, when the subject of cowboy boots came up. And uh, one, uh, John Rusnagel, who was a crops editor at Farm Journal in Philadelphia back in the day, and uh, one time at one of the Farm, Farm Journal meetings, somehow the subject of cowboy boots came up, and he mentioned this song that Jerry Jeff sings about Charlie Dunn. And I just casually mentioned later, I said, well, you know, that I happen to have a pair of boots that Charlie Dunn had made, and he went bananas. You know? Now, I didn't have the boots at the meeting to show them to him or anything like that, but he took my word for it, and he was, uh, like I say, he was impressed with me, uh, you know, putting it mildly. Uh, and at the time that Charlie Dunn made these boots for me, I had no idea that he was going to become the legendary uh, bootmaker that he has become. Uh, and one of the reasons that he's become legendary is because of this song that Jerry Jeff Walker wrote and sung and still sings. Uh, so I wore those boots all over the state of Texas. You know, there's a uh, Ernest Tubb song called uh, Waltz Across Texas with You, it's kind of a love song. You know, but I often think of these boots when I hear him sing that song, and of course when um, Jerry Jeff sings his song, naturally I think about these. I didn't know enough uh, at that time to get a picture of Charlie Dunn and me together, uh, neither did Mr. Pollard have any idea. In fact, I don't think we even knew anything about Charlie Dunn and the reason we had the boots made at that particular place was uh, Mr. Pollard drove me to the state office for the FFA program in Austin and it was there that he asked uh, the state advisor where would be a good place to have some handmade boots made and what he told, I remember what he told him, he said uh, Buck Stein, that's where you need to go to get your boots made. Well, yeah, <laughs> Buck Stafford didn't have anything to do with making the boots. You know, uh, it, it's pretty much the way Jerry Jeff tells it. You know, he was the businessman, but the man who became the legend was the little frail man who could feel uh, your run his hand along your arch top of your foot and tell you a lot about your your feet or if anything ailed, if, it, if your feet ailed you or anything like that, he, he could probably tell you that. Anyway, that's my point for today. And today's uh, concluding paragraph from How to Read a Poem and Fall in Love with Portrait by Edward Hirsch is as follows. This there is a great poignance to this quest for contact in the privileging of touch over sight. Since in a poem, touch must necessarily be metaphorical or symbolic. It cannot be literal or literally realized. Now, that is actually the three lines of this one paragraph. I'm going to read the second paragraph, the following paragraph, since that one is so short, because it goes into a little bit more about that point that he's making. So we get in two paragraphs. In the first poem of In Memoriam, Tennyson asked, Who shall reach a hand through time to catch the far-off interest of tears. 
is a good question. If the longing for direct contact, is that enough? Can it suffice for a poet's hand to reach across time or a reader's hand? Each of the following poems raises the subject of our interconnectedness. I'll try to say it again, interconnectedness. And each summons up the desire for such connectedness. It is the desire of solitaries. The sweat of the poet's hand still clings to each of these poems if we but let ourselves feel it. I think that's wonderful, you know. Uh, think about that last line. The sweat of the poet's hand still clings to each of these poems if we but let ourselves feel it. So ends our meeting.